think there are different types of barriers, but perhaps the most important one are connected with the awareness in the clinicians of the techniques and also the awareness in the engineering or science, science people in terms of the diversities of scenarios that can be represented or used in the context of the um, digital patients. I mean, there is a scenario more oriented towards diagnosis or others more for interventional planning or guidance, and each of them has a, you know, quite a different type of requirements, and those need to be understood and they need to be you know, addressed specifically. And the other aspect is that even if you have already generated some applications for a digital patient, you will need probably to do a, a you know, substantive training of the clinical uh, support staff for being able to use them and basically facilitate the take up by clinicians by facilitating basically the incorporation of those technologies into their workflows. And I think perhaps the single way to actually make, to get through these difficulties is by um, coming up with small wins, so, you know, real applications that are perhaps models from, you know, the point of view of all the ambition you could have in a digital patient, yet they can demonstrate the value for, for clinicians and the inception into the clinical routine. That's actually quite a, a difficult question because the sort of data actually, um, even assuming that in the clinical workflows that we uh, have currently been used in the, in the hospitals, even assuming those workflows produce the needed data, that is going to be very different depending on the specific scenario. Um, in many cases, you know, the in diagnostic information that is that matters is really coming from clinical history. In some other cases, it comes from, you know, all the medications that the you know patients are taking. Uh, in some cases, actually, imaging is the sole source of evidence that is uh, important. And the difficulty is that actually, never a patient has all the sources of data being acquired before you need to take a decision regarding the course of treatment. And it's actually the balance as to what is important in every moment what needs to be facilitated through the modeling techniques. So I would say that uh, actually the models need to be useful for guiding the clinicians as to what data to acquire, what is the data that actually can minimize the uncertainty we have on the patient's course of treatment, and you know basically what is the, the next um, you know, decision that you want to support. Um, that I would say that's the most challenging part of in terms of integrating data that will be very much depending on the specific uh, use case and the specific clinical scenario. For instance, if you are thinking in digital patient technologies for a GP, you would want something which is very lightweight, that is very intuitive, that is very simple to use, and essentially is more a way to organize the plethora of data that clinicians have access to at the moment. If you're in, instead of thinking about uh, you know, an interventional radiology, or so if you're thinking of a surgeon, what you would like is interface that allow them to uh, avoid uses of their hands while they are actually in the middle of the intervention and provide them additional information that they have, you know, through direct visual, um, you know, assessment. Um, and in one case, you have requirements of information coming in real time. In other cases, it's more about, you know, ease of browsing through data, what is, what is of relevance. So I would say that is very much depending on the specific scenario. Well, for use in the clinic, validation is really key. Um, I think that validation needs to come from both, from two sides. On the one side, we need to demonstrate that our technologies are able to reproduce, um, you know, knowledge in the clinics that has been generated over many years and, and is essentially, uh, you know, the, the current evidence. Uh, in some cases, however, you want that the validation actually challenges the status quo of what is known because you want to at the same time show that actually modeling can provide more information than the one you can gather in a sort of a you know more basic manner so i think it's, it's both you know proving knowledge that is known uh, and be able to reproduce it but also sometimes challenging knowledge uh, which is known and 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 the ambiguity certain uh, paradox that there still are in medicine could be ways to, to validate and evaluate and demonstrate value of modeling techniques. Yeah, in terms of future investments, I think there are two, two big areas. One is um, technologies which can be sort of 
uh, maverick technologies that help us to open new horizons like in terms of interfaces in terms of data management and data mining in terms of you know accelerated techniques for modeling um, you know and, and, and for data processing th those are actually quite important however I wouldn't undermine you know I wouldn't under um, represent uh, the resources for actually let's say keeping doing more of the current work we're doing because there is a still a lot of consolidation that needs to happen and not because we have some methods you know means that we are actually able to do things in the most effective way and especially that we are able to validate those techniques and bring them to the clinics so I think you know, I would say that there is some new technologies that need to be explored, but there is also a lot of consolidation work in terms of the you know transfer to industry, transfer to you know to hospitals that needs to to happen, and that perhaps doesn't seem very exciting per se in, in first sight, but it's actually pretty fundamental if we really want to go all the way to the clinic. If you would ask what sort of funding is required for what sort of activities. Um, I think there is always going to be the need to fund basic research and to fund um, so technology transfer type projects or more the emphasis on the innovation than on the research. But I think one specific type of area where we definitely need funding at the moment uh, is to fill the gap between the science production, so the papers and the, and the techniques and the methods, and also bringing up the early evidence of clinical use. Uh, because usually one of the main the main limitations for industry to go all the way to make a product is not that the technology is not there, but is to what extent that particular technology should be prioritized over 20 other ideas they have on their pi product pipeline. And, and usually what, what puts, what makes one idea to stand out of all the other ones is which is the one that will make the strongest clinical impact in the shortest time possible. Now, you cannot expect industry even after the end of the European project, to spend money for two or three years just to gather the clinical evidence. It just doesn't happen. And I think that's why a lot of very good ideas never get to industry. Um, I think one of the one of the beauties of the last you know, European call, the call 10, was actually that they were funding uh, precisely the, the, the clinical translation of the tools. It's not an apparently very exciting science. It's, it's about using the tools uh, you know, going over workflows, making things a lot more user friendly, testing you know the 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 usability of the tools, but actually that's what makes or breaks the possibility of of transferring this to 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 industry and to the clinic domain as well. I think there is a lot of um, exciting developments in terms of pervasive sensing, for instance, which are very important in terms of being able to monitor physiological signals on the go. On, on individuals that provides a continuum of measurement on the individual that can give you know can cover long term uh, you know long term uh, um, evolution of disease or or is starting to capture elements connected with lifestyle with environmental factors um, at the same time I think there is huge developments happening in um, imaging technology that especially in agile imaging technology that allows to start having imaging as well on the go and also other techniques of imaging that provides you a lot of spatial temporal information and physiological metabolical information that we we didn't have access before um, and I think that's actually quite important and I think there is also a lot of developments that have taken place in terms of data processing in particular you know real-time data processing massive data processing um, which which are fundamental for for basically being able to exploit and milk out so to say all this this uh, information that our current sensors can produce um, I think there is a still you know a lot as well to do in terms of exploiting the technologies for visualization and for human computer interaction in the context of the digital uh, patient uh, perhaps in there we don't need a lot of very novel techniques but we need to actually uh, capitalize a lot more on what has been done in the past for other domains and I'm sure there will be also new challenges that will arise in the context of this this particular project but I think there is a still a lot of technology that we haven't really used or exploited uh, you know in full. The involvement of the private sector is fundamental um, basically there is not going to be any penetration of the digital patient technology unless some industry takes it up and actually does the deployment 
uh, in particular in the digital patient, we are really aiming at you know GPs and, and a massive you know access to, to of this technology by clinicians, which requires that almost these digital patient technologies come as an add-on on current information systems. So I think they, they provide, I would say, the substrate on which data can be shared and on which uh, additional uh, services can be, you know, um, can be um, hooked. If you, if, you, if you allow me a comparison with the mobile industry, we, you know, we, we first had to have mobile phones and mobile networks um, and once those were established, and that took a few years, then you could actually start developing apps and services on top of that that give added value to the users. I think you know the digital patient for me is like advanced apps, but we also need this layer of connectivity and the layer of basic technology of access to the to the clinical channels that industry has. Um, there are different types of industry, and you know, and I'm not going to get here into the various sectors, but I think globally you can think about multi big multinationals and small companies, I, I tend to believe that small companies are a lot more agile in the way they actually have, you know, take more risky uh, and radical um, approaches to, to solve care care problems. Uh, and with those, there is a lot of, I mean, we have seen in European projects that we can have a very tight connection. There is also a few champions in the more big multinational companies, especially imaging vendors are particularly interested in, in, in these techniques because they realize that um, the imaging technology per se doesn't become any more the differential factor from the competition and they need to provide again added value uh, and in many cases imaging vendors also mean you know uh, healthcare um, so sorry medical informatics type of t uh, providers um, so I think they can have a very important role because they provide the data source but also they provide um, you know the, the, the infrastructure for connectivity and in many cases, imaging vendors also means physiological monitoring systems vendors, uh, you know, for 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 various types of uh, you know diseases. Um, so I think they also are very 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 important. Um, still, I think there has to be mechanisms of funding that, uh, in some of them that are industry led. Sometimes industry does does need academia, but not necessarily to come up with super revolutionary ideas but actually to transfer the knowledge they have into perhaps more modest from a scientific point of view uh, applications and, and product prototypes uh, and in other cases you and you also want to have some sort of funding schemes where they're more uh, research led where you incorporate industry more to be aware of the technology to provide their expertise to challenge some of the scientific developments in terms of uh, you know their practical usability and and the realities of transferring that to the clinics but yet you want that is, you know, you, you want kind of the crazy ideas from industry, from academia, sorry, to be uh, leading and pushing industry to the next level somehow.